afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. We begin today's program with an important announcement and discussion for Vermont farmers. It's about planning for the future. UVM Extension and its partners are holding a Transferring the Farm workshop this Wednesday, April 6th, at the American Legion in Middlebury. The workshop will touch on retirement, estate planning, and other topics related to farm business succession. It will be led by UVM Extension agricultural economist Bob Parsons. To find out more about specifics of the workshop, Bob is with us this afternoon. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you, Judy. Now, you've been doing these transferring the farm workshops in Vermont and New England for more than 20 years. Why is this such a big issue? Well, it's a problem that never goes away. I mean, our farmer age is getting older. We have more assets wrapped up in the, the hands of our older generations. And across the country, we have more farmers over age 65 than we have under 35. So because of high capital costs, it's difficult for young farmers to get started in. And the older farmers, you know, they have a lot of assets uh, that they have control of. And uh, they're kind of perplexed with how to get this transfer to the next generation. And, you know, this planning needs to be done because, you know, we're, none of us are getting any younger. At least I know I'm not. <laughs> so what's going to happen at Wednesday's workshop? Okay, we're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be speaking about uh, some of the issues related because it ties into estate planning, retirement planning, uh, you know, figuring out how to, you can transfer your assets, what methods are those, and the importance of getting the younger generation, giving them a roadmap of how they can start getting into the business and start gaining equity in, within the business. Now you've often spoken about uh, the five D's. What are those? Well, you have death, divorce, disagreement, disability, and you know, you just get on there and uh, you're always concerned about what, what happens if these in a multifamily operation. And this is one of the important things of having a written agreement that handles this. What if, what if someone is getting a divorce? How, you know, do you have some terms in there to protect the business from having to be sold in that case? What if someone, you know, you have disability insurance? In the case of death of one of the key partners or even one of the minor partners, how is that uh, person's shares going to be taken care of? Maybe you need life insurance to be able to take care of that because one of the things like in a year like this year when we have uh, low commodity prices as well, lower commodity prices as well as low milk prices, you know, this is the last time you want to have one of the partners say, he goes, I, I think I want out. And he goes, I'm, I need my cash in 30 days and, you know, the rest of the business needs to be able to figure out how they can continue to come on. If you have a written agreement about this, this will help take care of those arguments that it could occur in that situation. Situation. So in the, in the workshop, you're going to be talking about what if scenarios. A lot of what if scenarios, because that's what you're planning for. You know, it's like, what if the world just falls down on you or something like that? But, you know, what if you have a death? What if you have a divorce? How are we going to take care of this? Because we want the business to be able to continue and not have sudden stress of having to come up with a bunch of cash at a time that uh, is very inconvenient and may force the business to be sold. And so uh, what's likely to happen to a family farm if there isn't such a plan? Well, if there isn't one, what ends up happening is you end up having disagreements over something when something does happen. It usually happens with the death of mom or dad. And, you know, then no one's made any plans and, you know, okay, maybe the will was made out 30 years ago and it includes the farm to be divided with off-farm heirs. And if you have to divide the farmland, you generally kill the farm business. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to the workshops like the one that you're doing in Middlebury Wednesday, you also offer online workshops. Can you talk a little bit about yeah, those? Yeah, we, we have a uh, viewing of one of our workshops online that people can get to. We also have... Uh, you know, something like 30 uh, videos there that people can look at. They're six to eight minutes in length, and they might cover the issue, you know, what is estate planning? What is a will? What is a trust? What is an LLC? You know, how do you handle, you know, fair but equal distribution of assets? As well as we have six testimonies on there from, you know, various farms that have gone through various stages of the farm transfer process, and they discuss how they got to where they are. And so is this uh, farm transfer an issue that most people want to talk about, or is this an issue that at they some, like to avoid? At some point in time, they all like to talk about it. But a lot of times, you know, they say, well, when do we talk about it? Well, we'll, we'll wait till tomorrow. Uh, well, wait until everyone has time. You know, it just isn't the right time right now. And all too often, then it ends up we discuss it whenever it's the wrong time. That is after something happened, and there's very few options left to, to look at. How often should uh, farmers and these folks um, reinvest in their uh, plan, look at it again, maybe make some yeah, I mean, adjustments. General thumb, you know, you should always look at your will every five years, but you know, depends on what your agreement is, but sometimes there's some key steps. You go, so, okay, we're gonna bring the younger generation in as a partner, and in five years, we're gonna reevaluate where we're at and then figure out the plan for the next five years. These plans aren't etched in stone. 
you know, they're moving plans and they're always flexible within the means of the family. Everything is always up for discussion. Mm -hmm. And the first step people should take is what? First step is to get started, and that's usually discussing things with the family. Mm -hmm. And so um, I want to thank you for coming in. Bob's Transferring the Farm Workshop is Wednesday at the American Legion in Middlebury. For more information, you can check the website, uvm.edu slash farm transfer, or you can call 802-656-2109. That's 656-2109. Well, our next segment looks at one of the oldest breeds of cattle in the world. They're called Devons. Keith Silva tells us more about this uncommon cow. If you look on the Vermont state flag, there's a cow on the flag. It is a Devon that's on the flag, and it's been on there forever and ever, and I don't think anybody knows it. Devon cattle are stitched into the Vermont state flag and woven into the fabric of American history. Devons were first brought to North America by the Pilgrims in 1623. The hardiness and versatility of the breed made them a favorite of colonists like George Washington, who used Devons to plow fields and to provide milk and meat. And when it came time to cross the 2,200 miles of the Oregon Trail, it was Devon oxen leading the way. Come on, come on, come on. For Jeremy Michaud, come on, come agriculture on. in the Northeast wouldn't be agriculture without on, Devons. All of the open land in New England was harvested using draft power, and these guys were hitched to that yoke. Um, that's how colonial folks did it, was with these guys. And then they took them home, they unhitched them, they milked them, and fed their families. You know, that's the... <laughs> There's a lot of power in that statement and there's a lot of power in the breed as a result of that. In spite of their legacy, Devons fell out of favor once the engine of the farm went from animal power to gasoline and diesel. By the mid-20th century, farms had become specialized, producing either milk or meat, but not both, making Devon cattle nearly obsolete. How long have Devons been in the Clark family? Since 1627, every generation. Wow. Ray Clark so is the director of the American Milking Devon Cattle Association. I don't care what color they are, I like cows. I've, all my whole life, I grew up on a farm and I like cows. But my preference is the, are Devons because of their temperament, their longevity, their parenting ability, they're great animals. Old timers always said about Devons, they'll get fat on a flat rock and you can't kill them with an ax. Is it true? It's true. They're just tough as nails. The Devons' hardiness, resiliency, and versatility have caused a resurgence in the breed with a new generation of farmers. This is an ideal animal for the, you know, the, the, the local food movement, the homesteader who's looking to support or feed their own family at home. They want to have an animal on the farm that can provide them meat, milk, uh, graze a certain amount of ground that they have no use for, and can basically consider themselves a farmer uh, without the true expense of being a farmer. <laughs> You know, of owning heavy equipment and, 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 you know, managing people and cattle and shipping milk and all that stuff. You could support a small family with one of these cows. Devons are classified as a heritage breed because of their legacy. The Green Mountains and Valleys have always been a home for these animals. And Joe Emenheiser of University of Vermont Extension thinks it will be again. But one of the main factors is our land base. and. You know, the fact that we do deal with limited, fragmented pieces of land and small farms, uh, older barns and other infrastructure, and, and heritage breeds that, that were raised in those kinds of situations are still more conducive to that environment. Emenheiser often receives calls from people about buying Devons for homesteading. He has three words of advice. Research, research, research. In part because of the breed's flexibility, and because of their genetics. Crossbreeding a Devon to another class of cow can improve the quality of the offspring. According to the American Milking Devon Association, there are about 2,000 Devons in the United States, 
most of which are in New England. And products made from Devon's bring in top dollar. We've got people that are selling Devon milk for 10 to 12, 14 dollars a gallon. We've also got people that are selling cheese from 16 to 32 dollars a pound, depending on this variety of cheese. My cousin is selling Hamburg for 10 dollars a pound, all right, and can't make enough. Hey, Bella. You might call this the fat farm rather than the flack farm. Doug Flack operates the Flack family farm in Fairfield. He specializes in pasture-raised beef, raw milk, and fermented vegetables. Flack sells his own brand of sauerkraut and kimchi. He uses Devon's as the prime fertility source on his farm. Growing sauerkraut, uh, growing the vegetables, uh, which is cabbage, carrots, onions, garlic, requires really high soil function. If you, ha if you have poor soil, you'll get poor yields and, and the fermentations won't be healthy either. So you need really healthy plants and healthy plants come from healthy soil and cattle are uh, the integral part of driving soil fertility because that's really another core thing. So we have these fermented vegetables full of friendly bacteria that people should be consuming every day to keep their guts healthy. But if they're not eating a lot of grass-produced fat, they're never going to have all the nutrition they need. Farmers have long touted the health benefits of a Devon's milk and meat. In 2011, the University of Utah did a study on fat levels in Devon milk. The milk was found to contain high concentrations of beneficial fatty acids like omega-3. Increasing omega-3 fatty acids in a person's diet has been shown to protect against heart disease and possibly strokes. For flack, the vigor of the breed makes them the perfect animal for different and changing climates. What is really critical on a farm like this is they're super hardy. They're very comfortable at really low temperatures in the winter, and they're okay in really hot climates. You find them all the way in the Mississippi Delta. I'm actually dead serious about the hardiness. Their, their adaptability to climate, soil differences, all kinds of forage, because we're in the throes of climate change. And these cattle uh, have a much higher ability to endure future really radical issues of climate change. Um, in the context of the future, I think they're key. And either as pure animals or crossing them into uh, other breeds to, to pass on that hardiness, that ability to breed back fat. So they have many qualities uh, that the future will beg for. As for the here and now, there's another unique aspect to be aware of with Devons, those horns. Horns are definitely something that creates thoughtfulness. Yeah, thoughtfulness around Devon cows. But you have to be thoughtful around any cow because they're, you know, they, you, these cows are 1,200 pounds or whatever, they could step on you or, um, but the horns um, create a special thoughtfulness. Mother Nature put horns on them for a reason, all right? People think that they're going to stick the horns in you. They don't. If they're going to hit you, they hit you with the side of their horn. Because the old timers always said, the reason they don't use the point of their horns, they think they're going to get hung up in something, and they can't get out, and they're going to die. They claim animals can't think, but they do. They're extremely smart smarter than any other breed I've ever had. Resourceful, robust, and smart, Devon cattle have marked the history of agriculture in North America. Here's hoping their flag flies for years to come. In Fairfield, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Well, thank you, Keith, and thank you for joining us. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.